Nathan Nixon for, for this evening session. Thank you. I will check to see if these things are working. Yeah. yeah? Good. Yeah. Oh, welcome, Andre. Uh, I thought I'd do a quick introduction just to sort of remind people of some of the achievements. Um, about 2000, with Michael Berry, uh, you were awarded the Ig Nobel Prize for levitating a fog in a strong magnetic field. Guilty. And guilty. guilty, yes. And uh, <laughs> here in 2004, you isolated and characterized uh, graphene with Kostya. And then in 2010. And with seven other people. Ah, right, seven That's yes. very important. Collective yeah, there, there is a, there is a yeah. theme running through this. You are very good at collaborating and doing collective stuff. You <laughs> notice this. Um, you uh, got the Nobel Prize award in 2010, and then other things like you, know, you were awarded the Royal Society Hughes Medal, and you published over 300 peer-reviewed papers. You're one of the top 10 most active researchers in the world. Blah 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 blah. We could go on for this and take up the whole thing. <laughs> there. So I thought you, you're actually quite a unique individual, really. So you've got some unique or distinguished aspects to your career. Um, you are the only scientist to have been awarded both the Ig Nobel and the Nobel Prize. I don't think anybody else has done that yet, has it? Um, the only Nobel Prize winning scientist to have bungee jumped from a very high crane. Uh, is that uh, in the, uh, London 2017? Yeah. My contribution to practice. <laughs> <laughs> and as preparation for this, I watched the video because Andre struck the video to himself, the camera. Your expression didn't change on the way down. I would have been screaming. There's this, this some nerves of steel there. And then finally, just to sort of pick up on this collaboration theme, um, I discovered that you are the only scientist to have ever co-authored a peer-reviewed paper with a hamster. Uh, I gather this is uh, Tisha. Yeah. And how nice did you get that past all the reviewers? It tells something about our review system. <laughs> <laughs> Either that or the hamster is very special. <laughs> yeah. uh, actually, he contributed directly into this research. This is, uh, uh, people ask me about why I put uh, uh, hamster into the paper. Uh, and the paper was um, from the Netherlands, Nijmegen, where I worked at that time. And uh, I love to reply to my unsuspected Dutch colleagues that it was the only person who helped me while I was in the Netherlands. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't expect lots of sympathy from you. <laughs> um, and then, you, the Nobel Prize goes, you get all this stuff. There's a massive amount of activity being taken place. You have these <coughs> enormous, impressive buildings here, all filled with world's best scientists. I didn't contribute anything to the building. Uh, architectural part is done really? by Kostya, and so all these solids and etc. He took personal care about those. <laughs> I always told to everyone that I'm not industrialist or property developer, so don't blame me for that. <laughs> There's a whole host of activity around the world that really kicks something off. Not many people have the impact that you have. Um, just looking, if you could just step back for a minute. Uh, we were tempted, by the way, when we were planning this, to think about reviewing what had gone on in the past, but then we decided we'd probably just look more towards the future and uh, keep to the sort of science thing to start off with. But it is worthwhile just sort of reflecting on how far things have come. And just look at the prominence graphene has, not only in the academic world, but it's made an impact sort of on a lot of people's lives. And it's increasing by the pace uh, all the time. Why do you think graphene has had such prominence and such success over the years? Yeah, it's more philosophical question, probably. But probably it's... Uh, important when you work, especially uh, planning your work as an institute uh, in future, like John, you have to plan the work of this NGI, whether it's a blip or uh, many of you in the audience who thinking whether you have to run away 
into something else or stick with graphene despite sales not coming through. <laughs> so a long-term perspective is uh, quite useful and uh, my long-term perspective is the following. Um, all materials we have ever dealt with, they intrinsically three-dimensional material, thickness, length, width, and so on. Uh, graphene was the first material ever which essentially has no thickness. It's a two-dimensional material. I can go on saying that many scientists, there were scientific axioms and theorems which uh, uh, claim that this material shouldn't exist and uh, uh, the material itself managed to go around all those theorems. So two-dimensional materials, one atom or one molecule, think they do exist. And this is important because it's a new class of materials which we were not even aware of just 15 years ago. It was completely hidden world of material science and uh, uh, graphene, you know, it's not alone. There are many brothers, sisters, cousins of this material. By now we probably studied dozens of those, we're aware about hundreds of those uh, materials. So it's a new class of materials. And uh, if you look at the history of the human race, it gradually built up from Stone Age to Iron, Bronze, and etc. Age, arguably now we live in the age of plastics and silicon. So I wouldn't be surprised uh, that next uh, we are coming into the age of two dimensional materials. Uh, and uh, that says it's all. It's uh, not that quick transition from one age into another age because one of the big problems, as you know, for for materials is uh, is uh, that uh, uh, we don't have tools. We we are three-dimensional <coughs> humans. Okay, we have three-dimensional tools. It's very hard to deal with completely new kind of materials, but it's gradually coming uh, in line, and industrial applications it gradually increases. You know, graphene has so many superlatives. You heard about those those uh, the strongest, the most conductive, the most this and most that and so on. But one superlatives which is particularly relevant to this audience is I believe this material is the quickest we jumped from an academic lab into consumer products. That's another superlative of this material. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The pace of change is astonishing, and I suppose you don't really notice it when you're living through it. You just stop and take stock of what's been happening. You suddenly realise um, what a, a massive amount of uh, change we're living through. And by the sound of things, that's going to accelerate more into the future too. Um, there's a lot going on, and there has been a lot going on. Thinking about sort of milestone developments and sort of achievements that have been loads in the field of graphene, what sort of captured your attention over the years? Well, uh, it's, uh, whew, as you say, you live with, within this, you flow, you go with the flow and then you don't notice how this flow changes, accelerates or goes through some rapids and so on. But recently, uh, one of nature journals, I believe it was, Nature Nanotechnology or Nature Materials published uh, the, mo the 20 most important papers uh, over uh, celebrating uh, uh, 50, 15th anniversary of uh, material which actually nature rejected twice uh, before it was published in science. But I, think I, have, I don't have any crunch about this one. Um, uh, but uh, 20 papers. So 20 major achievements, so I think uh, uh, if we take the stock and look uh, uh, first five years, we knew practically everything about graphene itself. Material has been done and dusted by 2008, 2009. Uh, 
then uh, one of a sudden we graphene change from 1.0 into 1.5 uh, 1.5 uh, stage when it becomes uh, an absolutely astonishing in terms of electronic quality uh, community and we contributed a lot into this step when we start making so-called encapsulating graphene it has little relevance so far to any industrial development but in terms of fundamental science you get a system which is uh, cleaner than any other system have ever been developed electron shoots through this material from one side to another side even if it's uh, tens of microns long the biggest we, we can make uh, samples and that brought a wealth of new phenomena which people still continue to study and so on and there was uh, a lot of stuff uh, about uh, one of the work which I value which came from from, uh, from our group here people know about graphene oxide for example that it's completely impermeable to gases and then highly permeable to water um, at least water vapor and, uh, and there were quite a few achievements so what <coughs> astonishingly graphene reincarnated itself every few years each time people saying okay it's it's getting boring and people try, including ourselves, try to look for any other material, sisters and brothers, which is also a hot topic of research. One of a sudden, some uh, make a little bit twist and trick and uh, material comes completely into a new incarnation. The latest one came about a year ago. When when people twisted graphene a little bit one layer against another and this has become a superconductor with very low density of electrons it would never be uh, a room temperature superconductivity but it's an interesting system to address previously unaddressable fundamental questions so I don't know how long it would uh, last this kind of cycle so a reincarnation but I, I think for quite some time and then there is an infinite combination of graphene with other two-dimensional materials so in terms of fundamental science those PhD students in this institute they are safe they can follow this route until they retire Tell us the facts of where you were coming from earlier where you were talking about graphene being uh, a new age of materials coming through. It's a sort of like a gift that keeps giving. Two dimensional in. materials, graphene like materials. Graphene like, yeah. I, I think, uh, I always thought that I got the Nobel Prize, okay, I can't argue about that. I, I take what they named the prize for, it's for graphene essentially, uh, its properties and so on, but I always thought that our second paper would show that graphene is not alone, but uh, has many sisters and brothers is more important in long terms of graphene itself also it delivers materials and new results much slower than graphene but it's just hidden in the shade of graphene at the moment yes so it maybe it when is. you look at the back it is they'll see it's these it's just quality um, <laughs> with benefit of hindsight i'm not sure that everyone uh, in academic community would share my opinion but essentially all re is relates to the quality of the materials because the higher the quality the more phenomena usually easy to address increase quality by a factor of 10 and you get a new phenomenon that's the basic rule since the early days of science uh, science for centuries this rule hold it and it's the same for graphene but unlike any other similar to dimensional material graphene is inert and chemically most stable material this determines why it's so much better quality than other materials so molybdenum disulfide if you if you increase its quality 
even to a fraction of quality of graphene. It might be even more interesting system, but we are living with what we can achieve in the lab, and the quality of graphene is much higher. Constantly chipping away at the edge and advancing forward bit by bit. And exploring as well, because I think that's a theme uh, in your life as well. You're quite comfortable sort of being at the edge of what's known, I would imagine. Yeah, I don't like to work in the crowd, okay? When, when the crowd is, is made, it means too late, okay? It's like uh, I usually compare if there is a uh, why work in, the, in a piece of grass where there is a tribe of uh, elephants already there? So we are looking for, each time we are looking at least in our group, we are looking for a patch of new grass. Yeah, so somebody wants to send, by the time more rewarding, you, yeah. Yes, by the time you see a bandwagon, it's too late. Yeah. Try new ground. Um, well, it's usually, actually, in the community, bandwagon is too late. But I was not talking about even bandwagon. We, which means too late. I'm talking about when there is a hyperactivity and people, people. Well, in America, for example, it's uh, rewarding to go into this activity because it, it the hype brings uh, publications and rewards in terms of grants and so on, which is not the same as bandwagon, but okay. But uh, in my opinion, close to it. Just pick up on one little detail that you mentioned earlier. Was, um, you talked about the uh, bilayer graphene and uh, how it's just twisted at that. Was it about 1.1 degrees or something? It becomes a superconductor and yeah. about 1.7 Kelvin, is it something like that? 2 Kelvin. 2 Kelvin, yeah, something yeah. like that. Do you think that's got legs? Do you think that um, <coughs> is an area of fruitful research in the future? Because of it's got the name Twisted <coughs> Legs, hasn't it? As marketing. Yeah, there is electronics, Swisstronics, Spintronics, and many other tronics. And uh, as long as there would be academic communities, there would be people who find a nice version or whatever they get, they discovered. I, it's an interesting area in terms of how flexible the system is in terms of uh, adjusting parameters because twist. Uh, literally rather than figuratively speaking adds a lot of, of possibilities to change electronic structure so with a little bit twist you essentially go from one kind of metal to another kind of metal I'll take it like uh, moving from uh, say gold to uranium by, by just changing a little bit by a fraction of degrees the changes in electronic structure of this material changes as dramatically as from lithium to uranium and this is very important too to understand the fundamental phenomena in properties of semiconductors and other phenomena if, if you say that it has anything to do with uh, with uh, you know uh, reaching room temperature superconductivity is it's not okay well it's still the area of active research in this community because <coughs> I remember you know, five years ago I, I declared that uh, my disassembling three-dimensional materials into individual atomic layers and then stacking them back in, into some interesting sequence <coughs> we might be able to reach uh, uh, room temperature superconductivity and above. That's, uh, well, I bet it's possible, but okay, how to achieve it, it's another problem, but uh, with this twist, uh, it's a little bit high, we probably always will be at very low temperatures <coughs> for fundamental reasons. I, I, I have arguments about this one, and probably it's generally accepted that it's uh, scientific curiosity and scientific area for research rather than for anything else and uh, I, I, I was uh, I was okay a couple of weeks ago at Huawei and serious people there dealing with serious issues like mobile phones okay they they ask me well what about this 1.1 degree I mean should we look more accurately at this one I, I just I just for, for better thermal conductivity, I just fall laughing, okay? <laughs> um, yeah, 
people do like to sweat the small stuff when they're when they're thinking on the stuff. Yeah. But it's interesting. These this twisty stuff that's going on there. If you couple that with these heterostructures, so you've got um, I don't know how many two D materials there are in the uh, out there. The Hundreds. Yeah, and you're probably looking at quite a lot of them. So this whole idea of putting things together is not only sandwiching up different combinations, but also the possibility of twisting as well. So it might be that it could be room temperature, some conductivity, which is sort of the holy grail, isn't it? Um, it could be out there somewhere. Uh, you should be yeah. a serious, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, just sort of coming back to um, a bit of the global view, having taken a brief dive down into a little bit of uh, detail, um, just want to pull you back up um, and just sort of get your view on the sort of global landscape of this whole field of research. So. Just thinking about where some of the most interesting work's being done, sort of geographically. Um, we've got Europe, Russia, <coughs> China and Asia, America. What do you see coming out of these different areas? Oh, um, I can't say anything about Russia, despite my accent, okay? <laughs> but uh, um, the most visible developments are certainly in China at the moment. The amount of money which was poured into graphene in absolute, in absolute terms, of, in terms of manpower, <coughs> particularly, has been enormous. And it's, it starts paying off. I know companies which are profitable already in terms of uh, selling graphene. They, they, they went uh, through break uh, uh, even. A year ago, or a couple of years ago, maximum before it was all uh, in money. Now, now they have become profitable, um, uh, and uh, but the developments in uh, I know that there are developments in Europe, uh, in England, in America. In America, it's a little bit in the U.S. and. Uh, Estimated, I will say, because I saw the very, very little development. But I, at least, I know one company which is kind of already has uh, products. It's uh, essentially um, graphene nose for blood tests, where previously they used plasmonics. Now they use graphene array of sensors, specially functionalized already for a couple of years a lot on the market they sell it with this kind of chips uh, to everyone uh, limited uh, niche area area but uh, but they do sell this one in europe also we shouldn't underestimate there are not only companies which still burn venture capital companies but uh, i was impressed recently a couple of guys Full professors from Italy, uh, you know, with tenure, with tenure position, guaranteed uh, future, fifty plus uh, years old. They quit their position at universities and in, in academic institute and uh, went full time uh, to to their uh, company job. That's quite impressive. So that is, so that's probably tells me more than anything else uh, about. Uh, this was in it. China. No, it was in Italy. Oh, in Italy. Okay. In Italy. This was in Italy. Two Italian guys. Okay. So in Europe. So so things happening. That's probably the most promising sign. I would say more promising than break even for one or two companies. Yes. Yes. Good point there. People vote with their legs rather than with the best of money. Yeah, yeah. So watch what people do rather than watch what, what they say. Yeah. Better. Yeah. Yeah. Um, where do you see the most interesting work being done in the future? Where's, where are the hot spots? Uh, this could be <coughs> either geographically or it could be in the fields of research. The short answer, K, Sira, Sira. Whatever <laughs> will be, will be. Spanish say. Is that because it's got like an emergent feel to it? Where, where? Look, 
people, I don't know how many people uh, in industry share this view, but in academia there is kind of prevailing view that uh, uh, things go revolutionary way, essentially not very different from the view of uh, tabloid journalists, okay, something happens one of a sudden, like, you know, in software today you get an old mobile phone that uh, two years later smartphones did come from, which is which is software development rather than any hardware in, the, in uh, mostly of material science development, especially because all this uh, essentially continuation of silicon chips so uh, things in, in real life with materials in particular which is a level beyond okay architecture below silicon and uh, improvement of things are uh, happening much slower on the scale of several decades and as i already mentioned for graphene things uh, getting quite quick uh, quickly um, we have to celebrate what we we have already now i mentioned those chips another another example I'm not sure about those shoes from Inno Innovate, which you have seen those, how large improve, well, I know that the improvements are real, but how important they are not real, but uh, taking Huawei as an example, okay, they, I think they use now, they told me they use 300 tons of graphene per year, and this is not uh, graphite powder, which most of the people here are familiar with. It's single layer graphene, uh, starting with graphene. So they use graphene oxide, disassemble graphite into graphene oxide, then make graphene oxide laminates, uh, and then um, kind of uh, reduce it, so-called reduce it, remove all those uh, functionalized group. Before we have done similar work here um, about five years ago, made very thin graphite films. They're not very different from graphite. It's kind of to the uh, stratic uh, graphite, I would call it, which means that uh, individual layers are randomly stacked, but it's as dense as graphite. Uh, we use them to, some, some of you uh, have seen bricks covered with this uh, uh, graphite film and so on. We wanted to use it as an inert, chemically inert, robust, completely impermeable field as a protection film. I always suspected it would be a good thermal conductor and it turned out to be a very good thermal conductor twice or two and a half times uh, less thermal conducting than monocrystal graphite. It's extremely high. Graphite is one of the best thermal conductors, but you can't use it because you can't make anything from graphite. It's random pieces, chunks of graphite in batteries, when you press it together, it's not as thermally conductive as monocrystal graphite, but this uh, disassemble, assemble graphite, that shows this high thermal conductivity, and now it's used in a uh, couple of places, including the back of uh, LCD screen to reduce its temperature, for the case of LCD screen, it's about one degree reduction of the temperature of the screen. But some of you know that the, when the screen becomes hot, it's not that pleasant. So they think that it's very important. It's also used to reduce temperature of the chip. So this is high-tech graphene at long last coming, not only pressed or whatever graffiti powder which is there. So it's a very quick development, but it's diffusion, it's not revolution, there are not revolutionary products 
yet at all. It's gradual improvement, but what do you expect? You can't expect suddenly Intel switch from silicon to graphene chips. It's, it's completely unrealistic. It takes too much energy, too much money, too much effort to do this kind. So you expect gradually people put something. You wrote in your journal about four, I believe, who who tried, I, I heard the story from someone, they tried the graphene to put on the screens as a heating element. It didn't work out, but then they tried to put in different plastics and it turned out to similar to this graphite car, uh, which is outside. They find out that it becomes slightly lighter, uh, slightly more robust and so on. There is a diffusion and as you hear good positive news, this good positive news translates into funding to applied research, sometimes funding or fundamental research, and this not a circle, this sp spiral continues to propagate. So eventually there is no doubt about this. Uh, eventually we will see kind of principally new products based on two-dimensional materials. I would expect that I think it's practically that inevitable that at a certain moment we will see kind of LCD screens and, uh, and uh, uh, transparent flexible electronics based on two dimensional materials. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah, it's just a matter of time. Yeah, it's not graphene. Mm -hmm. uh, most, most unlikely it would be graphene. It's uh, most likely it would be one of its sisters like molybdenum disulfide or something like that, semiconducting material. And, uh, but the problems with growth and so on has to be solved here. I heard that there have been progress now. Wafer scale molybdenum disulfide has become available half a year ago and then it becomes inevitable, okay? Because too many advantages to ignore for semiconductor industry. Yeah, when it starts to work, people will sit up and pay attention. And I suppose um, one of the things you, you mentioned about a couple of things there, um, just going back from what you said, the graphene in the Huawei phones, it originally, when you saw the marketing, it seemed like it was making the phone battery last longer, so people thought it was in the battery. But it's not, is it? It's, it's just conducting the heat all way better, so the battery doesn't have to do that hard work. Yeah, that's uh, Huawei. Okay, confused everyone, including myself. We we saw that uh, they sell this graphene mobile phone, which is uh, which is the box is is over there as a graphene technology. It turns out to be there are two innovation in this case. One innovation is this graphite thin film for as uh, heat spreaders, which is an important. I was told two of those, one cheap, one the screen, as I told before, this is graphene-enabled technology and uh, uh